You're listening to Cloud Security Reinvented, a podcast for security leaders with a focus on the cloud. Learn best practices from fellow security professionals and how they disconnect from it all at the end of the day. Cloud Security Reinvented. Good morning, or depending on when you are in the world, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. Welcome to Cloud Security Reinvented. I'm your host, Andy Ellis. Before I introduce our guest for the week, a quick word from our sponsor, Orca Security. Orca provides agentless security and compliance for your public cloud infrastructure, enabling you to detect and prioritize security risks in minutes, not months. I'm here today with Nick Selby, Director of the Software Assurance Practice at Trail of Bits. Welcome, Nick. Thanks, Andy. Really happy to be here. Really glad you could join us today. You know, across a security career, and we'll get to your multiple careers in a moment, <laughs> not only do we as professionals grow, but our world changes. And so I'd like to get some insight of what you've seen across your career, especially in light of the transition from the on-premise, you know, mainframe and microcomputer world that many of us started in, to the world of cloud that has become the default model for IT infrastructure going forward. But let's talk about your three career journeys. I think you had one career as a content producer. You're an author for Lonely Planet. You're an editor for the Tornado Insider. You're a reporter with the International Herald Tribune. And you were a VP at the 451 Research Group. What was that trend that like? I mean, you did span multiple areas that you were covering and creating a lot of content that a lot of people relied on. Yeah, and um, it, this, of course, came up during the interviews in every every job interview I've ever had. Like, why do I have the world's weirdest resume? I I tell a story that's a little bit different that um, essentially what my career has come down to is explaining really complex things in a very simple way to people who have an interest in, in understanding them well. Tornado, you mentioned, uh, Tornado was a publication that was created by a venture capital group in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And it was focusing mainly on uh, explaining the emerging world of mobile technology to the investors who were uh, considering investments in it. So I spent a lot of time up in Scandinavia in the late 90s, early early 2000s. People as as you know as 3G. My first 3G phone call was made from an Ericsson van. Like the phone was a van, yeah. <laughs> uh, like going through the streets of of uh, Stockholm and. Uh, trying to explain how these technologies would change our lives. And I remember saying, in fact, that, you know, I would, I would personally never use a phone on my camera like that. That's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. And the battery <laughs> technology would never support it. But even with Lonely Planet, which was just a lot of fun, I was spending, I spent 14 years outside the United States and, and five of those I spent in Lonely Planet. And, and if you take a look at the places I was covering, they were places that were, that people wanted to travel, but they were not straightforward. And the first one that I did was uh, Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus and spending time going to places that had not been open to foreign visitors since before the 1917 revolution. How do you navigate that in a world where everything was completely upside down? That to me, that was a really great challenge. 451, I think was really bringing together my my passion about technology, my passion about information security, and the ability to to explain. And I think it did more for my career in security than anything else, because I, in addition to just being uh, exposed to all this technology, I did 1,100 or more than 1,100 deep dive interviews with technology leaders, CEOs, CTOs, engineers, talking about how their product was going to solve problems and how it was going to do it differently from the way other people were doing it. And while they did that, how they were going to survive. And so over five years, ultimately leading the, the entire research operations team at 451, uh, digging into all of enterprise IT, I learned so much about the business of enterprise technology, but also the, the realities of engineering. And I bet there's a lot of commonality between, you know, giving somebody a travel guide to Russia and teach them how to do a security journey to a place that nobody is sure they really want to go either. I swear there is. And, and it's, it really is so often these things come up and, and the analogies from either world fit very well into the other. Yeah. So you also had a you know, more traditional security journey. You know, I think you started in the consulting space before becoming a practitioner. 
but you've been in a number of places from Cambridge InfoSec Associates, Trident Risk Management, N4 Struct, Secure Ideas, Bishop Fox, CJX, Paxos, you know, now Trail of Bits. So what has that journey been like for you as you've sort of walked the, the practitioner and the practitioner helper path? Well, the word satisfying comes to mind. <laughs> Interesting and and varied. Uh, I, I was spared for almost my entire career, I was spared the actual workaday toil of being stuck in a reporting structure as, as a CISO or as a CSO. And I was able to consult. And, and I think that, that these were accidental, like so many of us in the security space, uh, so many of us, like slightly older people in the security space, we came from someplace else. There mm -hmm. was no, the, the, there really wasn't the kind of structure that there is now for a information security path for, from when you're in college. I picked very well because at, at 451, the things that, that fascinated me were logging and, and what is now the seam world and data exfiltration, data loss prevention, data leakage prevention, and data theft. These are the, the areas that I felt that I could make the biggest difference. And it turns out that, that those things uh, work really, really well to support a cybersecurity incident response career, which is what I did from 2008. And some of those companies you mentioned, like Infrastruct and, and CIAI mm -hmm. and Trident, what we were really doing is going in and helping people when the defecation hit the ventilation. What has gone wrong? Are they still in the network? Let's prioritize, let's triage, and let's get this thing back up and running, create a short term, like an immediate uh, recovery architecture, mm -hmm. and then bridge that gap so that they can, they can put it into their medium and long term architecture. And those things and focusing on those things really helped by the time I think I was ready to sit in the CISO seat first as a, as a virtual CISO or a part-time CISO. And then finally, as a CISO, uh, I felt really very well prepared and well versed in the kinds of things that can go wrong if you don't pay attention to the small stuff. And then, yeah, you know, that's really fascinating because you had this other parallel career the whole time that has to do sometimes with, as you said, when the, the defecation hits the ventilation, that you've been a police officer. So you're a, a reserve police officer. I've seen with a couple of police forces in Texas. Uh, you wrote software, street cred software to support them. And you also worked for the NYPD. Like that's yeah. a fascinating journey there. Well, I mean, and that journey started somewhat differently. It was most people who you find in the infosec world or the intel world who have a law enforcement background, they started in law enforcement, they moved into the tech or the intel, yep. and then now they're in the private sector. I actually went the other way. I had a pretty established career in the information security space and a lot of consulting time you know, under my belt. And what I found regularly was that it was very difficult to get law enforcement interested in the problems that we have in the infosec space. And I got really tired of trying to make friends at law enforcement agencies just to get somebody, not even to kick the door down, but to like open up the, the file and look inside and see what happened. In 2009, I ended up talking to a police department down in Texas and they, they said, you know what, we want to do that. And we would send you to the police academy, you know, as long as you're willing to do the work. So I, you know, to my wife's great surprise at age 45, I went to the police academy. And as you say, I, I started out as a reserve officer unpaid. I ended up becoming a, a paid detective and, and mainly working network intrusion and ch uh, child sexual abuse material and other kinds of cyber crimes, but also getting into the world of cyber intel, the intersection of cyber intelligence and law enforcement. So by the time I, was I started speaking to the NYPD around 2011, 2012, to their intelligence bureau, they had an interest in understanding what was going on in, in the world of online intelligence. I started out as an unpaid advisor, then I started becoming a paid consultant. I ended up working with the Intel Bureau there and putting together their intelligence conference, their cyber intelligence and counter-terror conference. And then a position came open to direct the cyber intelligence and investigations for the NYPD's intelligence bureau. And that was one of those, I cannot say no to that. And so I did that and it was really a very rewarding opportunity to, to both serve and advance my understanding of, of what we do and how that affects people. And I hear it's much easier to find a parking space in New York <laughs> if you happen to be a police officer. You know, that, that the, the, the biggest challenge of leaving the NYPD was the ability to park anywhere. <laughs> and, uh, now, we couldn't park in bus stops, and we, we had to be very careful because there actually there's rightfully a group of people in New York who get really upset at cops parking anywhere, including bus yep. stops, fire hydrants, and on the sidewalk. But yeah, it was kind of fun. 
<laughs> so I think there's an interesting anecdote in there that I think can be relevant for a lot of people is a couple of those gigs you basically just started doing before there was money for it or somebody was really asking you to, hey, do this. You you sort of pushed your way in. You did something and you created an opportunity. And if somebody sort of has the, the good fortune to be able to do that, I think that is one way to advance your career. I completely agree. And I, and I, look, I think that, um, again, people of a certain age who are in information security, that's how we actually started at information security in the beginning. Right, because there, there was wasn't no an budget. information security budget. Yeah, there was no budget. There were, there were no people. It was just, you know, if you do it. And, and, and the thing is, and there is a, a very old saw about uh, there's no limit to what you accomplish if you're willing to not take the credit. If you are willing to go in and do the hard work and get things moving, then you are usually able to do it because often it's something that either people don't understand and it makes them feel icky or they understand and they just don't want to do because they know that it's going to be a lot of work. If you're yep. willing to do that and, and let your passion be the guide and not worry too much about, well, where's my bonus coming from this year? If you're, if you're willing to just forego the sort of normal things that people are willing to, for, that are unwilling to forego in a career, then you really can forge a, a new way forward. I think it right. helps to have some vision but it really just helps to be there, show up, and what? what is it? Success is 90% showing up? Yeah, 90% showing up, especially when nobody else wants to. Especially when nobody else wants to. Yeah. So, and, and I would really recommend that for people who are starting a career in information security or at a turning point where they're sort of saying, you know, I like the information security, but I'm in a dead end in the path that I've chosen. Find another one. They're out yep. there. And there will be an opportunity because you will find something that really floats your boat and turns you on and you think is the cat's meow that nobody else wants to do. Hey, it's yours now. Just, mm -hmm. just grab it and own it. I love that. So you've seen the world change a lot. What has been for you the most striking change around security related to the cloud becoming more prevalent? It, it has to be configuration, um, and, and in there is, it, it comes SBOM or, or something related to SBOM, but like, what, what are we building and how are we building it and how have we put it together? The assumption was, I think back in, you know, even 2007, as people started like moving from grid to cloud. And as we started thinking of, of the cloud as a place and, and initially it was a place of, okay, this is a place where we can kind of lift and shift and, and just dump our, our data center and fire Bill and Bob and, and just save money in the cloud. And, and that was mm -hmm. kind of the initial impetus, but everybody said, don't worry, we're never gonna put anything really Real there. important there because it's just not safe. And, and over just five years, I remember in 2013 having conversations in when I was doing incidents and, and showing up and talking to boards of directors and, and attorneys and, and people, CISOs, and, and they were like, well, but that's safe. It's in the cloud. And the, the, the perception just really changed. And I think as we made that shift, we did a lot of things right, right? We figured out how to scale. I think that the, the advent of AWS and, and later Azure and certainly now GCP, but as we, we figured out how to scale up operations, a lot of the people who are making those decisions about scaling up operations are the same people who grew up on a, in an on-prem space where the data center was in the basement. And those people, no matter what they do, they still have this bias toward the way we used to do things. And yep. that doesn't fly in, in the cloud world. And I've, I've said before, you know, when you make mistakes in the cloud, you are doing stupid at cloud speed. And stupid at cloud speed is really, really fast. So configuration becomes absolutely essential. And I, I would go so far as to say, if you take a look over the last three to five years at every significant breach you've ever heard of, it was somehow involving misconfiguration of a cloud-based asset, usually a very simple one, and mm -hmm. in, in violation of people's expectations. I, and I mentioned that SBOM has a place in this. You know, con contemporary software isn't really written. Chris Swan loves to say that it's assembled. Yes. And it's assembled of components. And these components all have their own dependencies. And so you have, forget SBOM, it's it's nested SBOMs. It's not right, it's like I a matryoshka doll of SBOMs. Yes, it is. And and so you you don't have to worry about what what you got that's that's uh vulnerable. It's what what you might got that's vulnerable and what it's got that might be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so understanding and being a master of what goes into the mix is just like configuration, the most important thing. And take a look at the just the last two years as, as software supply chain has become top of the pops to discuss. Mm -hmm. It's all about that. Yeah. 
So what's different in your industry? Like if I was looking at your industry and you get the joy, you can pick like four different ones if you'd like. But <laughs> what would surprise people from the outside that they have an assumption about what cloud security looks like and they're probably really wrong? I think at Trail of Bits, uh, and really I've, I've only just come here in the last few months, so it's it's still very new to me. And at Trail of Bits, it's a different outlook on the world for, for me. I've always been jealous of people like you and, and, and Chris Swan, who I mentioned, people who live five years in the future. Well, I'm in that group now. And mm -hmm. that's because our clientele are in the, you know, the top 1% or even top half percent. If you take a look at software security, software, you know, adoption of temporary techniques. So I don't like the word modern because it tends to date itself really, really quickly. But if you are engineering to the current best practice, yep. and in fact, pushing that current best practice in everything from your, you know, your SDLC to your, to your CICD pipeline and, and where you're putting things, how you're putting them there and how you're developing. When you're in that group and you are living at, as I say, in the top 1%, we are seeing uh, a trail of bits. We do see the future right now. We see where the rest of mainstream technology will be in three to 10 years, depending on where on that continuum uh, a given company tends to sit. So the biggest thing for me, I think, has been even when you do everything right, attention to detail becomes even more important. Yep. And questioning your assumptions at every stage. The, I fly airplanes. Most accidents flying airplanes are, you know, they're a series of, of bad mistakes. It's never just one, but almost all of those mistakes come from people being fat, dumb, and happy. Just thinking that everything is going along fine. If you are mm -hmm. not constantly correcting, constantly questioning, constantly looking around for your escape plan, constantly thinking about what could go wrong, you will get behind the airplane. You will get behind the technology. And once you're behind the technology, you're no longer a leader. You're just on for the ride. And yep. I think that that's the biggest lesson that I've had is that this even affects the very, very finest companies in the world. And I'm just thrilled that I get to see them. Yeah, I think there's a great line in uh, the Checklist Manifesto by Atul yes. Gawande yes. in which he says, like, the first the first thing on your crisis checklist needs to be fly the plane. Yes. Because otherwise you assume the plane is flying itself, you're busy in a checklist, and then you crash the plane because you forgot to fly the plane. Yeah. First day in, fl in flight school, they teach you, you know, the, your priorities are always aviate, navigate, communicate. Talk to people later. <laughs> the first right. thing is just fly the damn airplane. Yeah. So I think, you know, there's a, a lot of practices from the cloud era that resonate today, some that don't, but give me the one that most resonates for you. And then the one that sort of least resonates, what should we have gotten rid of and stopped doing? Well, the one that we should have gotten rid of and stopped doing is passwords ever. And I think that that it's pretty, <laughs> sorry, it's just such low hanging fruit, but I know that in the, in the Google SRE book, Carla Geiser said something to the effect of something has gone terribly wrong when an engineer has to touch a process because everything should be automated, which by the way, speaks to those are the things that we should be doing. Yep. We, we should be automating absolutely everything because if you're not automating it, you don't have control over it. If you cannot understand what you are building to the point that you can push it from start to finish in five minutes and have it up and running pull it back if you need to, but, but get it out there, right? If, and if you're not understanding what it is that you're doing to the point that you can automate each and every step of that, then you don't understand you're behind your technology. So right. that's, that's the, those are the practices that are good. The practices that are bad. And I, and I see this continually. And again, even in some of the best companies, oh, you know, the technical debt that is created in a moment, just in a flash, when you say, oh, I just want to get this thing configured. I'll just, I'll just log in on SSH and get that thing up and run that as soon as you say that it is too late and you have created tech debt that you'll never fix passwords are in that bucket and we should just get rid of them completely i gotta admit that you said that and i'm feeling really bad because my personal website i have to log in because <laughs> the let's encrypt cron job doesn't run correctly right so literally I log in, I read the cron tab, I copy and paste and just run it and it updates my script. And it's that exact same thing. Like here's this technical debt that if I forget to do that, like bad things will happen. Yeah. But imagine that at a corporate scale. And, and it's, you know, if you have more than one developer and you yeah. do more than one push a week, very soon, even that level of technical debt, that really simple kind of thing becomes utter, first of all, it becomes unmanageable. And second, it becomes almost impossible to enumerate. Yep. You, you've made, 
you've made notes in your head. You know, the Russians in the Soviet time, they had this, this expression, which is why you always saw Russians have a shopping bag. Always. They called it an Avoska bag, the just in case bag. Because by the time you saw something for sale and said, you know, that might be not, it's too late. And, and you, you just have to take action at the moment of the thought, it, you know, preferably yep. before. But if you come to one of those turning points where you have the choice of making a bad decision or making the right decision, you need to make the right decision because you'll never right. remember. No, I love, that's a great way to, to sort of look at that. There was an example of where my Russia travel experience can it's, help me with an analogy right. in the cloud world. Make, and it, these come up a lot. Yeah, make a decision quickly. There's a lot yeah. of things in decision theory. It's a, I think it was General Krulak who said the 70% decision will beat the 100% decision every, every day. Time. Yeah. Yes. What's the biggest surprise for you? Like if we look back, go back 10 years and think about what you thought cloud would bring. And now compared to what actually cloud brought us, what surprises you the most besides your willingness to have a camera and a phone together? Yeah, so it, it absolutely has to be the democratizing effect of, of the cloud on innovation. I can now build for about $6,000 what used to cost me about a million dollars. And I can build it on infrastructure that supports, not, not just supports, but is readily available, completely scalable and completely disposable. I can mm -hmm. test out any idea. And the fact that I can do that and the fact that this infrastructure exists means that so many other people around the world are, are able to do exactly the same thing. That again, I, I can do for $100 what I used to do for $50,000 in terms of prototyping. I can go out and I can get somebody in Moldova to make me a, a module for a whatever that I'm building. And I can try it. And if it doesn't work, I've lost a hundred bucks. But if it does work, I can double down on it. And I didn't see that coming. I'm not sure who saw that coming, but whoever it was, they, yeah, very far ahead. And it was, a, it was a great surprise for me. But this does come with a wicked and awesome responsibility that we, we just have to deal with. These things aren't free and they aren't yep. free from decision making and, and responsibility and especially strategic architecture. Because when you can do it like that, the, the temptation to take my very well functioning prototype and turn that into a production application is really almost overwhelming. Yes. We have to, have to, have to resist that overwhelming temptation. Temptation. Yeah, I have a, a similar surprise on that one. Many, many years ago, I think it was the hash DOS vulnerability and we needed to test, you know, we were a CDN. How do we test against all these different origins? Because yeah. we didn't actually have a lab with different origin infrastructure. So I'd reached out to the IT team and they're like, oh, it'll take us, you know, so many months to, to build it. And uh, somebody in my organization went to you know, Amazon and like stood up a dozen different origins of different flavors. We tested them, we got results same day. And then they came to me and they said, how do I file for reimbursement? Somebody who never interacted with the expense process before. And I'm, my first thought was like, oh my God, how much money did this person just spend? $80. 97 cents. <laughs> <laughs> so when I got the number, I reached into my wallet, I pulled out a dollar and I handed it to them. And they're like, oh, you'll deal with the program. I'm like, no, I'm not spending you know, several hundred yeah. dollars getting reimbursed a dollar. Yeah, it's like, that that is a very common experience. I think not just for people, not just for people of a certain age, but I think everybody who's who's in who's involved in technology at a company that has made the transition at any time in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. these the vestiges of the old way of operating still really haunt us. And we know how hard it is to change a corporate culture. We developed a lot of culture around just manifestly stupid things that that really don't need to be there. And breaking those habits is really just incredibly hard. Yep. That's a yeah, how do we how do we break the bad habits that might not have had a good reason, but certainly worked at the scale we were operating when now we're working at this sort of cloud hyperscale? Yeah. So what what piece of advice, you know, maybe it's in that vein, that do you wish someone had given to you earlier in your career that you had to learn the hard way that maybe you can pass on to someone? I, I quote my aunt Sadie in Never Show a Fool a Half Finished Job. Yes, and, one of and my I, I really believe, phrases. I, I really believe that 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 is tied very directly to what to this whole dynamic that that we were just discussing a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. of this this severe temptation to take a 
prototype that is able to globally scale. And I, I, actually, I think that in the in the biggest, if, if I have one big lesson from everyone I've worked with, it's that we still are biased toward judging our technology by its ability to carry out the functions and deliver the features that we wanted it to d d deliver when we, when we made it. And so if the features are functioning, we tend to say, well, that works. And I think that that is a huge, huge mistake because I have seen many working prototypes, many working products and applications in production that really deliver all the things that they do, but they, we haven't made questions about the core assumptions that went into it. And we haven't taken a look and, and therein lie a lot of vulnerabilities. And we, we think about log4j and, and, I, and I hate to keep quoting Chris Swan, but I, I just love the way his mind works. Uh, he was <laughs> asking me the other day, like what technical debt do we have that is load bearing? And what of it has metal fatigue at this point? And, and when mm -hmm. we think about log4j, that wasn't actually a security bug. That was a, a feature that was delivered without thinking of the security implications of it. And th that is not the only one of its type. <laughs> that is not a, yeah. a unique snowflake in our world. That's almost everything. So never show a fool a half-finished job is once you have that prototype, once you have that thing that's running, go back and build it right. It's not mm -hmm. a finished job. Yeah, and I suspect your aunt Sadie actually said it, Anar Tormein Kain Halbe Arbeit Nishtvezen, which is the Yiddish version of it. Yes. I actually use that one to talk about feedback. Like when you're giving somebody feedback, don't be the fool. Like if you were shown a half finished job, make yes. sure you recognize that you can give better feedback about yeah. that one. It's a, um, it's a wonderful expression. Yeah. And you know, how do you unwind at the end of the day, Nick? So it does come down to flying. I do love flying. I've recently rediscovered my flying. I flew for a lot in the in the late 90s and early 2000s. Then I was away from it. I'm, I've just gotten back into it. It is, to, to me, it's exceptionally relaxing in a weird sense because you're working constantly. I'm an instrument pilot. And, and when I fly, I'm, I'm usually flying cross country. I'm not, I'm not sort of punching holes in the sky like a weekend flyer. I, you know, we, we want to yeah. go someplace. And that means getting into the soup and getting into the mix with things that are much bigger than me. And, and, and it's a lot of focus and, and multitasking. And to me, that is a wonderful escape from the kinds of things that I think about uh, on a daily basis. And it, it really brings me into the zone and, and completely enveloped in the experience. So I, I really enjoy doing that. That's awesome to hear. And yeah, Nick, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us and talk to our listeners. Thanks so much for having me. This was really fun. Awesome. And you've been listening to Cloud Security Reinvented. I'm Andy Ellis, and you can catch us on all of your favorite podcast platforms. Thank you for checking out this episode of Cloud Security Reinvented, brought to you by Orca Security. Orca Security detects and prioritizes cloud security risks for AWS, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud without the gaps in coverage, alert fatigue, and operational costs of agents. Please follow Cloud Security Reinvented wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts or visit orca.security slash podcast to get immediate access to all of the latest episodes.